HVAC 360, episode number 25, Indoor Environmental Quality. Welcome back, everyone. This is your host, Matt Nelson, for another episode of HVAC 360. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Uh, today, we got a real great show for you. Um, we are talking with Robert Bean. He is a indoor environmental quality and energy consultant. Um, he has, uh, he's actually an uh, ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer. Um, I don't think he's a current one, but he was a past one. So definitely, he has a lot of uh, value and uh, 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 credit before, behind what he has to say. So um, here uh, we won't. Uh, I, <laughs> I think it's pretty much. I won't. I won't uh, keep you any any further. So let's just cut to the tape, and here we go. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome this uh, well, this week's guest, uh, Robert Bean, uh, who is a indoor environmental quality and energy consultant. How are you doing, Robert? I'm doing really good, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Not a problem. Hey, uh, you know, Robert, uh, tell me a little bit about your background. I'd like to just kind of start with that a little bit. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'd love, so we can get into the into the major topic. Let's just keep this short. So um, I actually have uh, two professional designations. Uh, one from the Association of Science and Engineering Technology Professionals of Alberta, and that's related to building construction engineering. And then I'm also a uh, professional licensee in engineering from the Association of Professional Engineers, Geologists, and Geophysicists of Alberta, and that is in the HVAC engineering. So how I got there is a long, <laughs> long boring story, Matt, uh, but I should say I actually have a background in, in the trades uh, and in engineering and also in, uh, in business. Okay. Now, did you did you start in the? Uh, I guess which one of those did you start in? I mean, did you start in the trades and then go? You know what? There's got to be you know uh, a, a smarter way to go about this. <laughs> that's pretty well. That's pretty well much what happened. I uh, you know, I actually started out first uh, working as a geotechnical lab rat, uh, doing uh, work with uh, engineers and technicians in uh, concrete soils and uh, asphalt. And then I actually transferred over into into the trades, and I spent a number of years doing uh, framing and uh, concrete uh, formwork and and uh, interior finishes. And uh, then one day, actually out on a on a on a basement job, we were actually forming up a basement. And then here in Alberta, it was nasty cold, like minus 25 degrees. And I just said, you know, what, there's got to be a better way to make a living. And uh, so I transferred, uh, moved into uh, surveying. Uh, technology, and uh, that's uh, that's how I got into the got into the, the business. Okay, so what about what is it about indoor environmental quality that that attracted you to it? Well, having been in the industry for so long, you know, I just wasn't seeing quantum leaps in terms of what was happening in the indoor environment and how that was relating to the occupants. In other words, we could do, you know, we could do great designs. Uh, but the number of complaints uh, wasn't going down. And uh, so that, to me, I just said, you know, there's got to be a better way of, of doing construction, doing architecture. And that's when it sort of said, you know, it's got to it's got to it's got to come down to the people in the space. And that meant learning about people as it relates to indoor environmental quality. And that, to me, just appealed because I just started thinking, well, you know what, if we actually started with the occupants, and like work from the inside out instead of the traditional outside in approach that what would follow would be good built and now when you look at programs like lead as one example is that because there's a focus a focus on indoor environmental quality um these buildings tend to res- or, or the, the approach tends to um result in better construction and uh, to me that's that's uh, that's where we need to go so now, how would you describe the uh, indoor environmental quality? Well, that's a, that's a, a good question, but it, I guess at, in, at the end of the day, um, you could say that the indoor environmental ergonomics of the space um, would stimulate what we see and what we feel and what we hear and what we smell. And 
if you do it correctly, in other words, if you have really good indoor environmental quality, all of those senses kind of go into a place, what we call homeostasis. And that means they're not distracted by negative stimulation, such as, you know, loud noises or, or bright lights or drafts or, you know, your, your office colleagues, bad body odor or <laughs> these types of things. And it's those uh, distractions that lead to reduced productivity the distractions lead to um, sort of uh, retarded learning abilities um, and certainly affects our general sense of, of well-being. So if we can create spaces where these senses go into this place called homeostasis, in other words, they aren't distracted, then people can focus on what they're supposed to be doing, whether it's learning uh, in, a, in an educational environment or whether it's, you know, office workers uh, in your typical uh, American uh, office building. Now, would you, now, as, as far as the alphabet soup that gets thrown around, the IEQ and the IAQ, like indoor environmental quality and indoor air quality, are, are those, you, you see those as two different things? Absolutely. And I'm really glad you brought that up because um, people, people like myself that study IEQ, and, you know, we, we often get frustrated at the industry's use of IAQ as a proxy for IEQ. And it's, IEQ is, is much bigger than just IAQ. And in fact, if you look at all of the parameters of indoor environmental quality, and that is the quality of the lighting, the quality of the sound, the quality of the odors, the quality of the air, uh, the quality of vibration, which is, uh, plays a, a role in there as well. You know, air quality is just really one of six elements. And in other words, if you have any one of those other elements uh, has flaws in it, or one or more, uh, regardless of how good the air quality is, uh, you'll still have indoor environmental quality that won't be satisfactory to the occupants. So, so what are the what are those six components? Well, just think about your senses. That's it, it, really that's what it comes down to. You know what what do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? What do you taste? What do you feel? And from a feel point of view, we're talking about both the thermal sensations. Uh, but also mechanical sensations through vibration. And people might think, okay, that's kind of a weird one. And and it is. But you do have buildings that are near airports, for example. You do have buildings that are near uh, train uh, tracks. Uh, you do have spaces where mechanical equipment hasn't been properly isolated from the structure. So as it operates, you get these vibrations, uh, vibrations in lights. All of these things will impact uh, the occupants. Now, when you're talking about, uh, I guess, do you look at more design type uh, interactions, or are you kind of more after the fact? I mean, where where do you come in on the design process for the indoor environmental quality? Right at the beginning. So, so what are right some, at the very beginning? Yeah, sorry. So no. So what are what are some of the design basics that uh, obviously you're 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 saying? Okay, well, here's the things that are important. You should change these. What what are some of the design basics that that really people should start paying attention to as far as you know designers go? So the first thing we look at is we actually start with the the project uh, on the land on, on what was going to be developed because. You can take a building, and if it's properly placed on the property, right at the very beginning, if that's done wrong, then you will then find later on as that project develops and is occupied that you'll end up with IEQ problems. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, you could take a, uh, a development that might be, say, downwind of a meatpacking plant. And if the wind, of course, is blowing in the right direction, that wind contains the contaminants, the odors from the meatpacking plant. And now you've got a building that just gets polluted with these with these odors. So looking at how that building is placed, where it's placed in relationship to other pollutants, uh, right down to even looking at how windows open and close. So in other words, if you have windows that open into the airstream, that's a, that now the, now the window becomes a sail and draws that air into the space. So we things things like that. You know, those are the starting points. And then you start to look at the closure itself, which has a huge, huge role on not only the air quality, but also thermal comfort. 
And so we look at trying to get the client to understand that as you improve the enclosure performance, you also then reduce the influence of negative temperatures on the inside surface of the building as it relates to the occupants. So and that gets into the discussion of things like what we call mean radiant temperature and operative temperature, which are the two phrases that are used in ASHRAE Standard 55, which is the Thermal Environmental Conditions for Human Occupancy Standard. A lot of people think, when they think in terms of comfort, they think air temperature, but air temperature is, uh, again, is not a proxy for thermal comfort. It's one of 10 elements in the, in the definition or the, or the elements that we look at from a thermal comfort uh, point of view. So now when we talk about HVAC uh, design consultants, is, is really kind of how you interact with them based on the ASHRAE 55 standards for uh, thermal comfort? Yeah, and my, I mean, my, my role in the world of working with engineers, to get them to understand the metric. that includes ASHRAE standard 55, it includes the 62 standards, both 1 and 2, which are the now, the other uh, guideline that was just published, and this is my plug for, for ASHRAE, is ASHRAE 10P. And ASHRAE 10P uh, was, uh, is, is a document that talks about the interactions of the indoor environment and the occupants. So between the 55 standard, the 62 standards, well, 62.1 and 62.2, and the 10P, there you've got four wonderful documents you know that are that are based on the health sciences, the human sciences, and you can put that in hand in the hands of the HVAC engineer and the building engineer and the architect and the interior designer, and get them to look at these buildings from the human perspective as opposed from the building perspective. Now, I guess so. You have all these standards. What, what do you? I mean, what's your feeling on uh, you know how well um, the engineers are doing? about uh, you know, learning about these standards? How, how well educated do you think most engineers are? Well, I mean, you can look at, you could look at post-occupancy surveys as one way of quantifying that, couldn't you? I mean, it's, if you look at, you know, if you took 1,000 buildings in North America, you know, on the continent, and you did a post-occupancy survey, I think you would find the numbers rather dismal in terms of energy and the indoor environmental quality. But if you look at if any of those buildings in that 1,000 sampling were constructed to a higher performance standard, and whatever that standard could be, it could be Energy Star, it could be Canada's R2000 for the housing, it could be a LEED building, you'll find that in these higher um, standards of construction that you'll have better uh, post occupancy uh, surveys as a general rule not always true but it but generally it is true so i guess what what are some of the th- major things that that engineers are missing then i think part of it is is that none of the colleges or the universities study the basics in human physiology and human psychology you look at i mean <laughs> at the end of the day when somebody in the world of hvac gets a call it will be a person making the complaint it's not going to be the air conditioner. It's not going to be the furnace. It'll be a real live person. And uh, so the first thing I think that the engineers are missing, of course, is that basic understanding about what does it take to actually make people comfortable. And that means you have to understand, you have to study uh, the human physio- uh, physiology, the systems that allow occupants to sense their indoor environment. And then the second thing is, is how does that information get interpreted by your brain? And when you look at, and that sounds strange, right? When, you, when, when engineers hear that kind of stuff, they go, what? <laughs> That's not, what does that got to do with thermodynamics or psychometrics or, or, uh, or electricity? Well, the reality is, is that thermal comfort is a state of mind. And in fact, that's how we define it in the standard, that comfort is a state of mind. So study in human physiology and study human psychology as it relates to the indoor environment. And you know what? That can take three hours. That's like a three-hour course. If an engineer could take that, he would then understand what it is that he is supposed to be doing every day of, of his career. So assuming that they've, they've, they've gotten the standard down and they, they've, they've done the right things, are there things that happen between design and construction that would you know, typically go wrong that you find? 
Yeah, I mean, buildings are they're, they're no different than cars or bodies, for that matter. You know, you take a you take a brand new car, and uh, you know, over the years, the more it gets driven, and the more it gets exposed to the the elements, it starts to break down, and things start to creak and groan and moan, <laughs> just like just like you and I do as we get older, right? Well, buildings are the same way. You can have a you know, you can have a perfect building that's been designed uh, with care and uh, it uses great indoor finishes. It's got lots of natural light. It's got a great HVAC system. But over time, the elements just start to, to wear and tear on it. And as soon as that happens, you get material starting to break down and the building starts to leak. And then as soon as it starts to leak, then you've got this you know, enclosure that acts like a filter or a sponge or a capacitor and it starts to absorb things or pass things through. And then as soon as that begins to happen, then you start to have indoor air quality problems, moisture being the, the biggest one there, and then also uh, thermal comfort problems with drafts and these types of things. So, yeah, even the best building, if it's not maintained, it'll eventually get old and, and, it, uh, and it'll start to leak. But during during construct during construction, what yeah. is what are some of the things that that you find that 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 go wrong during construction? I mean, I, well, I, let me ask you this: Are you are you involved during the construction process to over oversee uh, you know some of the some of the protocols that they may have in place? Yeah, we'll get called in to to do that type of stuff, and that is a really valuable service. So for anybody that's got a background in building construction and HVAC engineering or architecture, that that during construction um, client services is, is really useful. I'll give you one example. You know, uh, this actually occurred um, to a colleague of ours in the industry and uh, Allison Bales, who uh, runs Energy Vanguard, and he was talking about just the ins- insula- uh, installation of insulation and we've been out to jobs to see some of these uh, projects where friction fit insulation is not done properly. Well, what ends up happening is that when you jam insulation into a stud cavity, if it's not done correctly, you'll get voids. And these voids, of course, then promote convective currents in the cavity itself. And then it also uh, reduces the, uh, uh, the R value of that wall improperly placed insulation. Well, as a result of improperly placed insulation, you actually end up with a colder wall. And a colder wall, what it does is it draws more energy out of the human being. And, of course, it's that sensation of energy leaving our body that gives us that cool sensation. So things like improper insulation will infect the uh, the indoor environment from a thermal point of view. You can get things like landscapers. This is another one. We've done, you know, we teach courses to uh, HVAC contractors and we talk about IAQ and all they want to know about is filtration because that's how they think you solve IAQ problems. But you could take a landscaper, you know, that plants uh, pollen producing uh, plants in, in front of an air intake. And then all of a sudden you've set up a set of sequences that if you've got anybody that's sensitive to allergens, as soon as that ventilation system kicks in and it's going to start drawing pollen into the into the space, it can distribute that pollen into the space and then people will react to it. So there is nobody that's, that has immunity in the construction process. Um, everybody is responsible at the end of the day. And uh, for someone like myself, I really believe, uh, Matt, that you know we should be teaching the, the trades just real rudimentary stuff like this because – then maybe they'll have a better appreciation that you need to do insulation right and you need to do the landscaping right and you need to choose your interior finishes right. And if we you know, do that, maybe we'll end up with better indoor environments. Mm-hmm. So, so it seems to me, you know, some of the some of the things that you're talking about, like the landscaping, like the uh, the, the different types of uh, 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 you know sealants and and paints that people use, goes back to you know being designed properly. Not necessarily contractors. Contractors, I think, by by nature, just you know they'll look at a set of drawings and they'll they'll install you know, whatever they see in front of them. They won't necessarily try. You know, if, if these are some of the things mm-hmm. that are kind of a little bit too you know, outside of their realm of understanding, typically. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it goes back to that thing again. You know, we teach, well, let's put it this way. Contractors are judged by the building code, and the building code is a minimum standard, and it uh, it's based on how we put things together, not why. And if, if we, well, I, my personal experience is that when we teach people why, we end up with a different result. And uh, 
So I'm, I'm a big uh, proponent of teaching the trades, first why and then how. Okay. So now I guess if you if you you know followed all the uh, all all the uh, things that you should do the standards the construction went well how how do you make sure that at the end you know that you make sure that uh, the indoor environmental quality is you know as you as you did uh, you know as was supposed to be as designed I mean is there what what sort of different sort of sort of things can you do Well the first I mean in terms of metrics or measurable metrics, the first is going to be the occupants they are going to complain. I mean, if you, if, if, if there's an issue with uh, indoor environmental quality, they will, they will complain. Now, having said that, uh, any industrial hygienist will tell you that absence of evidence is not, is an evidence of absence. So there could be some indoor environmental uh, quality issues that people won't complain about, like radon, for example, or carbon monoxide. So um, though that's your first step. The second thing you can do is, is you can do uh, post-occupancy uh, surveys. And post-occupancy surveys can be done either from a point of time uh, or at a moment of time or over a period of time. And uh, these uh, surveys, they often, I shouldn't say often, but they do um, identify problem areas. And those problem areas can either be addressed through uh, field investi- uh, investigations, and in uh, and in the more difficult uh, challenges, you might have to bring in instrumentations uh, to uh, measure what's happening in that particular area over a period of time. And there are some fairly uh, I don't want to say easy to use instruments. But there are field instruments that can be used to measure things like thermal comfort, for example, the different metrics in thermal comfort, or some indoor air quality instrumentation for gases and particulate and these types of things. So first thing is, you know, clients, their, their, their complaints, and then you can do the surveys, and then if you need to, do, uh, need to investigate further, then you can do the instrumentation on it. So, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. or You know, and I, I guess I'm just curious, not, not necessarily being, you know, that educated about the indoor environmental quality per se, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, involved in, uh, you know, being involved in standards, is there any sort of protocol that people test for, or is it simply what you stated that, you know, you go in there, are there problems, yes, no, okay, if there are problems, let's go investigate it further, is it uh, some of those type of things, or are there certain benchmarks that if somebody was to uh, call you and say, hey, Robert, you know, I need you to you check out my indoor environmental quality before the client gets in the building, you know, what what would you do? Right. Yeah. So um, in some of the building uh, protocols, LEED is a really good example. And whether you're a fan of LEED or not, whether you love it or hate it, one of the things that does have in it is a protocol for indoor environmental quality in terms of post-occupancy surveys. And uh, and I should, I should before you even say that there is a process of saying, yeah, okay, this is this uh, space or this building has been designed to say, for example, ASHRAE Standard 55. And in the ASHRAE Standard 55, you look at all of the different metrics from things like radiant, what we call radiant asymmetry or floor to ceiling height, uh, uh, the thermal distribution. Uh, we'll look at things like operative temperature, humidity. And so these are all uh, values that can be calculated. And so you have to demonstrate uh, that they have been addressed or state that they're not a concern. And so that is done in a, in a in a pre-design or pre-construction stage, and then once the building is occupied, then the follow-up is with a uh, post-occupancy uh, survey. So programs like LEED have that already built into it. If that protocol is not built into the how, into the into the construction process, like the typical uh, you know land developer building a gazillion houses, there is no protocol for thermal comfort, for example. Um, and so that doesn't get done. There is the building codes, but as anybody that's in the, in the industry knows, that is, that's the bare bones minimum. I mean, the, the building codes have a statement in there that will, you know, say something like, uh, you know, the, the HVAC system shall be able to maintain, you know, say 22 degrees C or, or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, air, and then they specify air temperature. But that, again, like that's one of 10 elements in, in thermal comfort. So the building codes aren't based on thermal comfort. They're not based on energy. They're the bare bones. It's, it's like getting a D in, in high school, right? Yeah. Before failure is D. That's what the building codes are. It's a D grade. Below that is F. 
I, you know, I, I don't think people necessarily understand exactly, you know, I mean, the, what you're trying to say, if you went to the average person saying, okay, this home was built to code, and they'd go, okay, well, that's great. Well, you know what, it, it, <laughs> it's, it, if you translate it into, you know, buying like, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's the cheapest thing that the government will allow you to sell on the open market. Yeah. It's not supposed to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> it should it should be safe to uh, occupy that building. So here's so and what I love about this, Matt, is that you know you see people you know building the code and talk. Well, it was built the code, and then what they try to do is they try to negotiate down from the D, right? Your <laughs> D grade house is too much money. Reduce the cost. Well, what's less than D? It's it's an F. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's the that's the world we live in. People negotiating down from a D grade to get the F. Unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. But we can change that, right? I mean, we, we, that's what engineers do. You right. know, we, we need to take a better leadership role in the world of construction, in the world of architecture. And that's why I said, like, you know, you asked me in the beginning of this interview, you know, why the IEQ? And because I believe the IEQ is, is one of those leadership elements that when we design for the body instead of the building, that good buildings will follow. So now... Uh, Kind of following through with this process, we've talked a little bit about design, construction, a little bit about a little bit about operation. But if if I'm a maintenance guy, what should be my primary focus? Is it going to be an annual survey of, of 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 the occupants, or you know, what are the things that I should be focusing on, or elements that I should be uh, aware of? That's a that's another really good. A question because the maintenance part of a building, you know, comes after construction. So the building's up and running. Now, how do we make this thing, you know, stay within at least the state of commissioning? <laughs> and as you know, buildings, you know, once they're done and they're commissioned uh, over time, they lose that performance. So the first thing is is to keep the building in the state of of as close to where it was commissioned. Uh, when the commissioning agents left the left the building, and part of that is certainly looking at the structure itself, and that again specifically has to do again with moisture because moisture is the biggest you know damage function that's out there. So keeping the building dry, and so that means you know maintaining the caulking and the ceiling on the outsides, uh, keeping the exterior surfaces in good repair. That's that's first and foremost, and then the second thing for the maintenance crew is cleanliness, building hygiene. You know, when you when you go into buildings where the where the hygiene in the space is really bad, and you know, on one extreme, you can take a house that has maybe has somebody that's a hoarder, for example, or they could be somebody that has both a physical and mental disability, and throw in old age into that, and you go into these buildings or these homes, and it's just it's horrific. You know, these these types of environments. So, first thing is is the structure, keep it well maintained. The second thing, second thing is is the hygiene in the space, keeping surfaces clean keeping the, the space tidy. You know, if it's a school, for example, you're going to have somebody on staff that's going to be able to do that type of stuff. But it also, in, you know, encompasses the teachers and the students about keeping classrooms clean and, and tidy as well. And then, of course, is the uh, the systems, you know, the electromechanical systems. So we're talking about the HVAC and the lighting. So making sure that the, the, uh, the uh, air systems and the water systems, if they're doing a hybrid, hydronic air-based systems, that everything is running as designed, balanced, uh, maintaining filter, uh, filters on a regular basis, and uh, same, and then on the lighting side, of course, making sure that your lights are also in good repair as well. So that's, that's pretty much it. Building, hygiene, and the HVAC and lighting systems. So... Uh- when they're if they're doing that or if they're not doing it, what I mean is there a, is there a certain recommendation that you would have as far as ongoing testing or or anything like that? Um, you know, I guess what what would be your recommendation if you were to say, okay, what's what's your what's your standard across the board recommendation to uh, to building owners about their indoor environmental quality? Is it is it you know testing? Is it you know, uh, surveying, what would that be as a kind of an ongoing basis? Or is that something that, you know, you wait till something goes wrong? Well, isn't that, that, and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, you were told every year, you know, go see the dentist, go see your doctor, right? Get your checkups. 
right? When we buy a vehicle, it's, you know, make sure you, you follow the maintenance program that the manufacturer, you know, has established for you. So, you know, we do it with our bodies. We do it with automobiles. Or <laughs> We should be doing that. And, and the same thing is with, with buildings. You know, you take, you take the value of a vehicle or a fleet of vehicles, and you look at, you know, the maintenance that goes into that, and then you take that same value and you can apply that to a building. Why is it that a building that's worth, you know, say 10 or $15 million gets no maintenance when you have a fleet of vehicles that have, that's worth $15 million and it gets a, it gets a regular maintenance? So, uh, yeah, <laughs> there should be a protocol, and that protocol should include a manual maintenance and, and uh, evaluation. But that's not, of course, what happens in the real world. In the real world, is nobody does anything until there's a complaint. And by then, oftentimes, it's too late. I can give you an example of that where uh, in a uh, indoor air quality investigation that we did, uh, with, uh, which was a mold uh, requirement or mold uh, contamination, and uh, what had happened is that this couple had uh, started to complain about smells, and uh, coming out to the job site, we went into a storage closet and pulled back a bunch of boxes, and lo and behold, the whole wall was, uh, you know, was full of was full of mold. And then we pulled the uh, drywall out, and what had happened when we got into the wall is that this water pipe had leaked, and it had been leaking for almost a year, and the and it was just a slow enough drip that all of the framing members um, that were away from that pipe were completely bone dry, but the one stud that was right underneath the drip was completely saturated. You could, you, if you'd have taken that out, you would have thought that that thing had been in the lake for a year. And um, so, you know, there's, there's something that had they done regular maintenance, again, building hygiene, you know, just did a once, you know, once walk around the whole the property, looking at the outside, looking at the inside, just pulling boxes away from walls. That would have caught that. Uh, and, and then, of course, it wouldn't have uh, sort of got to that stage. Okay. Now, when you talk about uh, the indoor environmental quality, if somebody is like, you know what, I mean, this is something that I should be learning more about, uh, how do they go about doing that? I would say for the current practitioners, you know, those that are already out um, doing engineering work, is contact your local ASHRAE chapter. And these guys have a, you know, somebody that's in charge of their uh, educational programs at the local level. And there's a number of us that just travel the country uh, doing lectures um, on this very topic. And uh, if it's not, a, if it's not a, a distinguished lecture, it may be just somebody that's a local uh, specialist. Uh, or even some of the chapters now are making arrangements with individuals that uh, might have that knowledge and that they'll bring them in, not through the uh, ASHRAE D DL program, but just as a service to their local uh, to their local chapter. So individuals are out there. They volunteer their time to talk about these topics, and it's available at any, any place in, in, uh, in North America. For those that are in school now, if there is an elective on indoor environmental quality, I would I would jump in it in, in a heartbeat and uh, and now so that that would be my message to the to those that are in school take that elective if, if it's offered at your college or university if it's not do it through your local ASHRAE chapter and as a last resort if you can't get through the local ASHRAE chapters or through your local universities or colleges start picking up the books pick up the standards read them do the research work because it becomes a huge huge uh, valuable piece of uh, knowledge for your for your uh, profession okay. All right, so you know, basically, start with the standards if that's if that's what you, uh, you need, and uh, uh, try to get as many uh, you know other uh, kind of resources as you can. Yeah, for sure. And it's you know, it's funny. The more you dig into it, the more fascinating it becomes. And when you look at, for example, if you look at uh, human beings, we actually have about 166,000 thermal sensors in our skin. Cool, eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you take so you take take uh, take yourself. If we were to take you and skin you out like a bear skin and put put you up on the wall mat, <laughs> you'd cover about 22 square feet of surface area. So try to imagine 22 square feet of skin surface area, and on that is 166,000 thermal sensors. And then on the other side of your brain, take a picture of a $20 thermostat and hook it up to a furnace, and then try to compare those two. <laughs> 
So that's what, so when you, <laughs> do you see that? Yeah. So when you look at these standards and you talk about thermal comfort or you start talking about temperature, if you're really curious and you're inquisitive about what it, what does it mean to have somebody that's thermal, that is thermally comfortable, you have to start studying the human body and that'll take you into how does the body sense the indoor, the indoor environment and then you do it through these thermal senses and sensors and then what you find is that, that of course that information is part of your nervous system so that information gets transferred up through your spinal cord into your brain in a place called the hypothalamus and the thalamus and that's where all the decisions are made that's where at a at a below conscious level where you sweat where you shiver and then you get you can have conscious decisions like putting on a sweater putting on socks closing the window all of these types of things and and so you can read the standards but if you really want to understand it you got to ask why now are there why? Any, go ahead now, there, now are there any books about about this or I'd say, you know, if if you were to name, if you were to ask, you know, Robert, find one or two books that would be a good primer outside of the, you know, hardcore ASHRAE standard. It might be more of the, you know, physiological, um, you know, understanding. Is are there something that you is there something that you could recommend? Yeah, there there is, but <laughs> thank God for the internet, right? If you if if your listeners just Google this, you know, a text, a text string that reads um, thermal comfort plus uh, human physiology plus research. Those, those three words, you'll end up with literally thousands of results. And those results will take you to places like the Center for the Built Environment. They'll take you to Cambridge University. They'll take you to Cornell, Kansas State, uh, Anarchan up in Canada. Um, you know, most of the most of the universities have, that have a really strong architectural engineering program also do research work on thermal comfort, and those researchers uh, tend to have a, a uh, medical background or a human physiology background. And, uh, and in fact, if you go back in an, you know if you go back into the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Most of the ther- any any research work that was done on thermal comfort was done by a physician, and 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 it makes sense, right? I mean, because who made house calls? Mm. It was the physician, right? So when somebody was sick, they didn't go to the hospital. The doctor came to the house, and so doctors, you know, were the first sort of people that did indoor environmental studies and said, you know, what's what's happening here? So <laughs> you close that- the window. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's hygiene again, you know. But uh, so that's that's what I would do is I would just Google those strings and any document that comes from, again, from a higher education, uh, you can rely on it. And if it comes from a less than, than reputable source, uh, then, I would, then I would avoid it. And, and I want to be clear on that because there are some manufacturers out there that actually do fund really good high-level research, and they should also be used. But also be suspicious of manufacturers that do research, or part of me don't do research work, but make claims to things that are relating to IEQ, but don't have the scientific background to back it up. And those, I, those I always uh, stay away from. Okay, now I'm I'm gonna have to address the white elephant in the room. Sure. Now I've I've for for as you know as long as I've been involved in you know energy conservation projects and, and improving you know the the performance of a building there's always been one metric you know I can measure energy I can you know I can measure you know CFM I could even measure you know CO CO2 uh, levels in a building but what you know when you talk about productivity you know, obviously there there are you know studies out there. I've I've seen things where you can you know the 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 increase in productivity can dwarf any of the other energy savings because labor is probably the most in, most costly piece of your your building. Um, mm-hmm. Realistically, what what is out there um, that gives a little bit more of a a, a a teeth to to you know improving you know the environment of a building. Yeah, so the probably the best one there is the uh, GSA, General Service uh, Agency in the U.S. because they they're the the biggest real estate holder in the in the U.S. I don't know who it is in Canada where I'm from, but you know our, I'm certain certain our governments would be the same, you know, in terms of owning real estate and looking at people. 
So they actually have done a number of research projects. Um, so the GSA and then also and the uh, Danish Technical University has also done a lot of research work on productivity in spaces. So between, I'd say between the work that the GSA have done, DTU, and the other one, of course, is, is the Center for uh, the Built Environment out uh, of California. Um, you know, those, and there's other ones too, I, and I apologize for not mentioning them because they don't come to my brain right at the moment, but those three right there, uh, you know, the research shows that you could take a building um, over, say, a 20-year lifespan, and the number one cost of that structure is not the capital cost of building it, it's not the operating costs uh, for the building, but it's, in fact, the human element, it's the productivity, it's the, it's the salaries, it's the workman's compensation, it's uh, what they call presenteeism, where people are there, but they're not, <laughs> because they're sick. Um, it's being there, and... and you know, if you actually could do a time-lapse photography of a typical day in an office space and, and watch people, how they interact with the environment, you know, where they move away from registers, where they're adjusting their clothes, where they're dimming their lights, they're adjusting their chairs. So the whole ergonomics, how that affects people, well, every minute of the day, and if you accumulate this, right, like if you take a individual and you accumulate that time where they're having to adapt to their environments or trying to adapt and not succeed, well, you multiply that by however many people are in that space in that day times however many days of the week that they're there times however many days of the year times the number of years in the building. It's a huge number. And that number is in the research work that these organizations have done. So it exists. You just have to dig it out. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess uh, you know, wrapping things up here, uh, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what would be the best way to do that? Well, I think one of the ways, of course, I'm now on uh, on your uh, blog. <laughs> right? I'll be on your blog so they can get me there. And uh, then also they can also get a hold of me at uh, LinkedIn, where you're also on as well, which is a great, great uh, online resource. And uh, so that would be the second place. And then the other place is through our uh, our uh, website, which is uh, healthyheating.com. And healthyheating.com, it's it's a non, uh, not-for-profit online educational resource, and we address things like indoor environmental quality, energy, architecture, these types of things. So, so either on your blog, Matt, they can get me there now, or they can get me at LinkedIn, or they can get me at the website. All right. Well, I will post all those uh little uh, shortcuts so people don't have to scurry and write things in their car or wherever they're listening to the podcast. Uh, so I will have that on the website for their uh, use. So Awesome. I just want to thank you, Robert, for uh, uh, being a guest on the show. And I think, you know, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff here about indoor environmental quality that I think a lot of people can take away with. It's been my pleasure, Matt. And, uh, again, uh, thanks for uh, making this available. It's a great uh, educational resource, and uh, good on you for making it, uh, making it available to everybody. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. All right. And we're back. Uh, I want to, uh, again, thank Robert uh, for being on the show. Uh, definitely a lot of great stuff, a lot of great information. Um, you know, it's it's so critical. You know, again, I think it's it's making a building that you really don't have to uh, uh, worry about is is so critical to uh, to an owner uh, that they can just occupy. And, you know, I mean, again, that that word that he was using, homeostasis, I believe. Um, there's so many times. I mean, even even in my own <laughs> even my own work. Uh, you know, I sit ne- sit next to a big window. The the amount of time I go, you know, oh man, I'm just cold. My my fingers get numb. You know, nobody's really immune to this. Everybody is affected by it. Whether you're an architect, whether you're an engineer, uh, whether you you know, you know, are a uh, secretarial or whatever. Everybody, it impacts everybody. Uh, you know, it's always the big joke that you know, it's like it's like the cobbler's shoes. You know, the person who has the has the worst pair of shoes is the cobbler. The you know, person who who actually builds and makes the shoes. It's it's the same with the uh, you know the joke in the office that hey, you know, who who designed this HVAC system? This is this is awful, and it happened to be the same engineers that worked there. Uh, so. You know, or uh, back in the contracting days when I was with a contractor, it, it's like everything was broken, nothing was fixed. It's like, you know, can't we can't we just send a tech up there to to fix the air conditioning unit? 
please. It's it's miserable here. So there's so much effort that uh, you know really is lost uh, when it comes to a work day. Just being distracted, not being able to focus on what you need to do, your day-to-day job. So again, I guess a, a great topic. And again, thank you, Robert, uh, for being our guest uh, today. Aside from that, if you want to know what's coming up on HVAC 360, you can stop at my blog at uh, buildingx.co and check it out, or if you're already there, fantastic. Uh, You can uh, hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me. I'd love to do that. Always looking for new people to uh, to interact with. And again, I will. Uh, if you if you are a Twitter uh, addict uh, or just somebody who passively uses it, you can find me at Building X on Twitter. So, if you like this episode, share it with somebody. And if you uh, if you want to uh, give me a review and think how it went uh, on iTunes, I'd love that as well. Or if you'd like to leave some feedback, you can always comment on the blog for any uh, sort of show that you would, uh, you'd listen to. If you liked it or you hate it, you can just leave it right under there. There's a comment section. Uh, everything is, is pretty much wide open, um, you know, just as long as it's not too commercial. I'll, I'll delete those. But uh, I want to leave everything up there, whether it's good, good feedback, bad feedback, uh, or what have you. So, all right. I appreciate every one of you listening. Uh, it is and great that I'm able to do this uh, for you, and I hope you enjoy it. So until next time, remember, know what you build and share what you know. Hey!